so uh, you're all guinea pigs. I'm going to try out a new talk on you. I pu put out a book about uh, three days ago with a guy who's much smarter than I am, Steve Gullens. And if we go to the first slide, that'd be great. Um, and it's about the next human species. And I actually don't mean that facetiously. I actually mean this to be a work of science fact as opposed to science fiction. Because there's a lot of speculation about this stuff. But let's talk about it in actually serious terms. So let's start with a great first line. And if you start with this, and you assume that there was nothing sitting out there in the universe, and then a single pixel point of light explodes, turns into trillions of galaxies, sextillions of stars, and that turns into the Milky Way about one third of the way through the story. Okay, And then you're sitting over there near where the sun is. And then about 4.6 billion years later, the sun is created, and shortly thereafter, Earth is created, and very shortly thereafter, life is created. So life appears, and then it goes kaput. That's the end of life. And that happens five times, at least. So here's the story, right? You get this explosion of the universe. You get sextillions of stars. About 2 thirds of the way through the story, you get the sun, the earth, life. Five times it goes kaput. And that means that about 99.96% of the history of the universe takes place before the first hominids show their faces just to put it in perspective. And as you're going through this stuff, there's kind of two theories of this case as to what happened over this 14 billion year period. Theory number one is the be all and end all of creation. The reason for the purpose of the universe, the reason for trillions of galaxies, sextillions of stars, is to evolve hominids, is to evolve what's sitting in this room, it's to evolve Rush Limbaugh, and it's to evolve Howard Stern. <laughs> and that's the be all and end all of creation. Okay, That's the purpose of the universe. That's why we're here. And that's as good as it gets. <laughs> now, the only problem with this theory is that this, if that's all she wrote, and that's the purpose of creation, that is gospel truth for most religions. Right? You go and you read most holy books, and that's what they are telling you. This is as good as it gets. And that's the purpose. And as you're thinking about that stuff, here's what a chart on belief in you know, our evolving out of non-primate species looks like. And it's pretty constant since 1980. So when you find you know, something like this on the playground and it suddenly appears, right? there's two versions to this one. Version number one is, well, geez, that was created 7,000 years ago. Version number two is that's about 300,000 years old. And no, Richard, you can't play Hamlet with that later. But as you're thinking about what the consequences are of actually believing that evolution just goes on and that there have been other species of hominids and evolution does continue, then you begin to ask questions about gospel truths. And that question might be, and I'm sorry if this makes people uncomfortable, might that be mildly arrogant <laughs> to think that the be all and end all of creation is what you're looking at right here? I mean, I know there's some really impressive people here, <laughs> but it's conceivable that there's a sextillion stars for a different reason. No? And if that's true, then let's try a second theory. So here's theory number two. <laughs> and, and why would we even consider that there could be an upgrade from what's in front of me here? I mean, come on. So as you're thinking about that stuff, there have been at least 24 different versions, this being one of them, Heidelbergensis, of what exists here. And in fact, we keep discovering these. This one was found this year. So we keep finding these different versions. Now, maybe again, the purpose of 99.96% of the history of the universe is this version, or maybe not. And if it isn't this version, then one of the questions we might start asking is, so why is there a single human species? 
Doesn't that seem a little odd? Let's, let's try a thought experiment for one second, okay? Here's a world with a woodpecker. And guess what? There is nothing in the world but that species of woodpecker. There are no robins, there are no seagulls, there are no parrots, there are no peacocks. I mean, it would be a little weird if you were walking around the world and there was a single species of bird. Why do we assume it's normal to have a single species of human, particularly when there almost wasn't a single species of human? One of the reasons why you get multiple species across multiple habitats is because it's really dangerous to put all your eggs in one basket. And in fact, 2,000 years ago, there were about only 2,000 humans alive. And this is what that could have meant, just to put it in context. Never mind this stuff. So as you're thinking about this, here's what lifetime on the planet looks like for hominids. We actually coexisted with at least six different hominids at the same time on this Earth. It was actually normal to have various species of humans wandering around different parts, different niches at the same time. And now we've got one. And as you're thinking of the consequences of that, one of the questions you might ask yourself is, if we are not the be all and end all of creation, if at some point we're going to upgrade, what would it take to upgrade? And what we've been finding in genetics is minute changes make an absolutely massive difference in this stuff. So as you go forward with this stuff, that's what a single gene will do. One gene, 200 fold differential in body weight. Here's what one different gene will do in a human being. You take an H2RC2 gene, scientists are always great at sexy names, and you come up with blue eyes. And that occurred to a single person near the Black Sea about 10,000 years ago. And boy, did that come for an evolutionary advantage. And as you look at these tiny little changes in human beings, when you talk about minor differences in human beings, here's Svante Pavo examining a Neanderthal skull. And when we're talking about the difference between human beings and Neanderthals, one of the things he found when he sequenced the DNA of both creatures is the real difference between a human being and a Neanderthal is 0.004% of gene code. It does not take a lot to upgrade a human being from a Neanderthal into what we see today, Congress accepted. <laughs> and as you're thinking of the consequences of that, these little minute changes really don't make that much of a difference because the difference between a human and Neanderthal really doesn't come in any of the cognitive genes, it comes in these three areas. You have a slightly different sperm and, well, whatever you want to call them. You've got a different smell and you've got a different skin. And that's what it took to upgrade a species. How much have we heard here today and how much are we going to hear here tomorrow that will make more than a 0.004% change in our body, in our cognitive abilities, in our size, in our lifespan, in how we look, in how we smell, in how we reproduce? Because that's the threshold you're looking at between these different species. As you're thinking of the consequences of this stuff, you know, we just saw the nature piece with Eric Topol. Here's a really important question, right? So as we start sequencing hundreds of thousands of genomes, as Craig cranks up his stuff, as George cranks up his stuff, what if we start finding differences? Because we've been sitting here for the last 60 some odd years for a very good reason, arguing we're all one, kumbaya, there are no differences, and we're not going to accept differences. And we'll get into why at the end of this talk. But as you're thinking of the consequences of this stuff, you begin to take specific genotypes, take a 577R, and one of the things you're going to find with this is 84% of Africans carry this versus 49% of Eurasians. So what? Well, it turns out that every male Olympic power athlete tested carries at least one copy of this gene. Different gene, 77% chance of living a long life. 
different gene, got a variant of an ACE gene, that's good because if you don't have it, you are simply not going to climb an 8,000 meter peak without oxygen. Virtually every person who's climbed an 8,000 meter peak without oxygen carries that variant. And just as occurs with blood types, we're beginning to find real differences in gene types. And as we begin to think of the consequences of this stuff, let's try just for argument's sake to come out and argue what might be next. What does an upgrade look like? As you're thinking about life as imperfectly transmitted code, it means that we're moving from reading life code to writing life code. And that is a very different circumstance because if you look at the latest catalog, and it's conceivable some of you don't have this in your bathroom, just in case you don't have the Harvard Biosciences catalog in your bathroom, the stuff that Tony Atala was talking about last year, you can now buy and try at home. So you can go out and you can buy your bioreactor to make hollow organs or bronchia or trachea or blood vessels at home. Or maybe you can go out and you can buy your little machine that makes mouse hearts that beat in a box. And yes, you can try this at home. As we think of the consequences of this for our species, as we think of upgrades to our species, as we think about 10.2 million plastic surgery procedures last year, here's what's going to start happening. And what's really interesting about the system is it's not one technology, it's not one person, it's a whole series of technologies that you're looking at today, each of which can come together to cause an upgrade. I'll give you one tiny example in one chapter in the book, the microbiome. So we heard yesterday there's 100 times more non-human cells in your body than there are human cells. And this starts getting really quirky because this zoo is a really interesting zoo. Pop quiz. Where do the most microbes on your skin live? It turns out that they live on your forearms. Where do the least microbes on your skin live? It turns out they live behind your ears. Mama was wrong. 17% of the microbes on your left hand match those of your right hand. As we begin to understand the impact of this on digestion, on wounds, on how we treat people, on how we deal with people, on your gut having about 165 times more genes in the human genome, we begin to understand that this little microbiome actually is really important. And the key question is, what if we become a species that directly and deliberately begins to engineer parts of its own microbiome? That is a quantitative change. And by the way, we're beginning to do that. And no species on Earth has ever done that. That is one chapter in this book. That is one chapter in what is changing. That's simply the microbiome. It doesn't have to do with beauty or brains or performance or sex or culture. Those are additional chapters, but we have only got two minutes left. So here's a message. Evolution hasn't stopped. Darwin still has a posse running out there. And as you're thinking of the consequences of this stuff, the fossil record is showing us that the rates of extinction are speeding up on the one hand. And on the other hand, we're beginning to create synthetic species, as Craig Venter will tell you in a few seconds. And that stuff has consequences. And the argument that I'm making here today, and I'm making it actually seriously, is that we're beginning to generate what is called, in my mind, a homo evolutus, in Steve Gullen's mind, a homo evolutus, which for better or worse, is a hominid that directly and deliberately controls the evolution of its own and other species. And that is very different from a homo sapiens that is conscious of his or her environment, but that is guided by his or her environment and evolves according to the environment. This is an interactive process where we become symbiotes and we become people that are very different. And we are very rapidly going to have to evolve an ethical, moral, and religious backbone to deal with this and pass on to our descendants because we sure as hell haven't treated the other versions very well. What does that ethical, moral backbone look like and why is it so essential? Because some of the debates we've had around stuff like this, like eugenics in the 1920s, got really, really ugly. We took science and misapplied it in ways which were absolutely devastating. Here is one of the posters that you saw coming out of Germany. 
And one of the justifications for going out and forcing sterilization is we're not standing alone. The US does it, the Nordic countries do it, Britain's considering it, Switzerland's considering it, why shouldn't we? Last forced sterilization happened in this country in 1969. So as we go forward and begin to deal with this stuff, we have to understand it's not just humans that species, it's not just dogs, it's not just plants, it's also ethical and moral systems. You can take a common tree like that of Abraham, and as you look at Abraham, that begins to speciate, and you get Judaism, and then you get reform, and you get orthodoxy, and you get a whole series of other things, and then you get a different branch that becomes Christianity. And Christianity goes into Syrians, and it goes into Orthodox, and it goes into Protestants, and goes into Catholics, and Franciscans, and Opus Dei, and all this rest of the stuff, and they're all speciations adapting to a different belief system and environment. And the nasty little secret in this is just as happens with species, most religions go extinct. In fact, more than 90% of religions in this world have gone extinct, which is why when you go into a museum, you see Zeus, and you see Poseidon, and you see Aphrodite, and you see the gods of water, and you see the gods of corn, because they became useless. And as we evolve, so too do our belief systems have to evolve, and we need a strong moral and ethical background. And by the way, if you happen to be religious, a god that is not Earth-centric or Homo sapiens-centric happens to be a far more powerful god. And these two things have to happen together. We have to have a debate about ethics, about morals, about religion, about what we're doing in this room. Because this is a hell of an adventure. It's going to get really exciting. And I'm not going to tell you about the two experiments that occurred last year that begin to structure this in a really interesting way because I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Great.